Good evening, everyone, and welcome to St. Andrews on this very special night of Christmas Eve, the night before our Savior is born. Please feel the presence of Jesus in this room, and please, as well, virtually, please feel the presence of Jesus as you are praising God together. Let you please feel Jesus deep in your hearts as we go through our service. Welcome, family, friends, guests, and visitors. Welcome both here in this sanctuary and those worshiping with us virtually. Welcome to worship on Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve is a time of mysticism. It's a time of revelation. It's a time of God working in this world, working in a world that God has been working in since the beginning of time. Christmas Eve is a time of experiencing what is your greatest experience during Christmas Eve? Is your experience focused on the world of gift giving, helping others, loneliness, pain, challenges, and, and injustice? Or is it focused on experiencing God? For those that say it's about experiencing God, is your focus experiencing God anew or the same? Or for those rarely experiencing God, is your focus on experiencing God new or more? Tonight, we're going to focus on experiencing God. So let's begin by asking God to be present here tonight with all of us here in this building and those virtually. Help each of us to experience you in this service. So be it. Let us worship. Please stand if you are able now and join in. Hymn number 234, verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. O oh, come, all ye faithful.
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I don't know if you heard, there's a new sound in the house. We have this cellist here who's, I think, world famous. That's right. That's right. Give him a hand. He plays in orchestra, teaches, does all this stuff, and he plays the cello in addition. I was joking with that. Um, so we're happy he's here. It's Michael Newman. He is in the uh, bulletin. Um, but I don't really have a good singing voice. People tell me. I think I do. So I'm sure it sounded perfect. I was in tune with you, wasn't I? All the time. All the time, yeah. All the time. See, they're trained to ignore sounds around them to just be with what they need to do. So we are, have a, it's a pleasure that you're here. So thank you for being here. And now we're going to turn to Ken and Judy for the lighting of the Advent wreath and Christ candle. So um, you're, okay, we're good. All right, come on over. Tonight we rejoice, for God's love became flesh. <laughs> Tonight we praise in gratefulness, for God is alive. Tonight we rejoice, for God is here. And so now, unfortunately, you also see this as a chancel choir, but there's no choir, unless we just make Pastor Betty the choir. <laughs> um, everyone's sick. <laughs> um, and they all got sick of essentially today. Um, so we don't have the chancel choir. And also, if you notice, Vi's not here. She's also sick, so we're praying for all of them. Although Izzy has stepped up, and she will be singing the solo that Vi was going to sing. So we're going to become... I guess the chancel choir, or we're just going to let you guys play it. What are we doing right now? You're just playing it, or are we singing it with you? The angels we have heard on high. He just, he's a soloist right now. All right, so if you want, you can sing along, but he's soloing. He's going to improvise. He's going to improvise. You can sing along if you want. Who knows what he's going to do? <laughs> and just, you know, the entire sermon is on experiencing God, and every service so far has had an experience you're walking out of here saying, what an experience that was. It'll fit perfectly with what we're going to talk about. So you're on. Enjoy. Let's hear some songs. Thank you so much. And so now we're going to take a moment and um, pray. Um, so let's just go into an attitude of prayer. Um, uh, what that means, you raise your hands, you raise your hand, or uh, raise your eyes, you close your eyes, you bow your heads, whatever that needs for you. But let's pray. Good and gracious God, we are here in your presence, a presence at 10 o'clock at night, the day before Christmas, a presence that we know by knowledge is always love, grace, mercy, and healing. And so, O oh God, in these moments of prayer, we come to you first with thanksgiving in our hearts, a thanksgiving that knows that the blessings that flow around us and through us and in us 
are because of you. And we give you thanks for those blessings as we reflect on what tonight means to us. But, oh God, we also come to you with hearts heavy for those areas of our lives in which we need healing physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. So, oh God, we come to you asking for healing in all ways, shapes, and forms, but knowing that you have the healing we need and may not be the healing we want. So in those gaps, let us rely on your strength and courage to walk this path with you, a path that you've walked with us before, a path in which you walk behind us, with us, and in front of us. And, oh God, we uplift all those that are dealing with the cold, the bitter cold, homelessness, addictions, food insecurities, those areas of our lives that it seems like darkness just overtakes us. Let your light of Jesus shine bright so that they can be guiding for us. And we pray for all those that can't be with us. May they also experience you in ways that help them to know that you are active and alive in our lives. So, oh God, in these moments, let us hear your still small voice. Let us experience you in a new way, and may we draw closer to you during this time. It is in your holy name of Jesus, the one that is born of Mary, the one that was born in a dirty stable, that we know that you have shown us your power of love because of what he did for us. And so in your holy name we pray, amen. And now, if I read the hymnal correctly, it says, a hymn is up, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, number 240. I think we're all singing this and with some cello in the background or in the foreground or somewhere. Let's stand, <laughs> let's belt it out so those sleeping can hear us and wonder why we're still up. scripture this morning 
comes. You, you may be seated. Oh, yes, you may be seated. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Comes from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to divorce her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife. The word of God for all people. I'm up next, right? You're up next. Okay, good. I did read that wrong. I thought you were next, and like I read that again. So, all right. I got it right for the first time tonight. Three times in a row. What does it all mean what does it all mean? In fact, how would you answer that question? What does all of this, the church, this time of the year, this nativity set behind me, the gifts, your life, all aspects of it, the good and the ugly, what does this all mean? How would you answer that? In fact, what does this birth of Jesus mean? Or even, what does Jesus mean to you? You see, for some, the answers are intricate and complex. And for others, Jesus means very little or nothing. So why is the meaning of Jesus so different for so many? Is it just the knowledge? Meaning that if you knew the Bible better... You would know God better. The more you read, the more knowledgeable you would get. And therefore, that would create a complete and intricate meaning of Jesus, the knowledge you hold. Frankly, however, if it was the knowledge, that's all we need to just believe, this world would be very different, wouldn't it? I mean, imagine a world in which all you needed was knowledge alone, to believe. First, there'd be no overweight people, and there'd be no Doritos, ever. We don't want that, do we? If it was just knowledge, there'd be no candy, because fruit would be what we need for that sweet tooth, and therefore a youth group would not be fun anymore. There'd be no violence, because we'd have conversations and the ability to say, we agree to disagree, and we can still live mutually together. That sounds impossible, doesn't it? If it was just knowledge that we needed to believe, there'd be no abuse, just nurturing love and care. Wouldn't that be incredible? And finally, if it was just knowledge, there would be no Ancient Alien series that has William Shatner as a special guest hosting Who is God? And I know we're getting way out of hand here, but I also believe we can keep going on, right? It seems knowledge isn't enough because knowledge doesn't change things. Something's missing. Anybody want to take a guess what that is? Anybody want to take a guess what it is? More than knowledge, we need experience. I think somebody already heard this before. <laughs> experience experience is what creates the meaning of something not knowledge knowledge helps but experience is what creates meaning just think of the first time you learned to drive i mean you knew the knowledge of how to drive right you knew where to put your hands you understood a left turn and a right turn you knew where the brake was and where the gas was you knew all that but the moment you got behind that wheel that knowledge went away didn't it 
and you didn't have any of it. You needed experience. I was young enough, well, I'm old enough now, but when I was young enough to get my driver's license, it was at the time like 15 and a half. By 16, you could have it. And so there I was learning on a Dodge Club Cab truck, which if anybody knows what that is, it's a two-seater, huge, big um, uh, pickup in the back, and it was manual, so it was a stick shift. Um, so one day I went out driving. Now I lived up in the mountains of um, near Carbondale, uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania, so all the way up there. I'm driving a street. My dad's in the car with me. How I did it, I don't know, but I knew I was supposed to take a left. I knew I was supposed to use the clutch. I knew all that stuff. Ended up in the field. As I ended up in the field, I ended up next to my dad, pushing him almost out the car. I don't know how I had my hands anywhere. My feet were still on the brake and the clutch at the same time. He never drove with me again until <laughs> I got my license. It didn't matter what my knowledge was. My experience taught me how to drive a stick. Or better yet, my eye surgery. I was told all about it, whether I'd be in pain or not. Most of the time, they said I wasn't going to be. They told me I wouldn't wake up, or if I did, do no big deal. They told me all this stuff. I had all this knowledge. None of it really was true. But now my experience of that is when I go for the next series of surgeries, I'm going to be fine because I know what's going to happen. It's all about experience. Experience is what our scripture is about today. Now, there's only two Gospels that talk about the birth narrative. Obviously, one is Matthew. That's what we read today. Anybody know the second Gospel? Luke. Yeah, the other two don't have it. And they're two completely different stories. So there's a couple elements we want to focus on. But before we do that, what has, your, what, what has been your experience of God? In fact, there's no one answer for this. Because for some, Jesus or God is the word, the cornerstone, the vine, the good shepherd. For others, Jesus or God is the bread of life, the way, the Lord, the mediator. For others, it's the Son of Man, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the light of the world. For others, it's glory of the Lord, the morning star, the Redeemer, the Son of God. For others, it's the Prince of Peace, the I Am, the Alpha and the Omega, the Savior, the Man of Sorrows, Christ and Emmanuel. How many names does God have for us? Why do we need all those titles? It's because it's a way to help you and I experience God. When you look at your life and you look at it about how you've experienced God, how many of those descriptions describe your experience? You see, experiencing God is possible for all. Experiencing God is possible for all, no matter who you are, what you've done, what you haven't done, what you've thought of doing, what you haven't done. Experiencing God is for all, and it can happen right here, right now. Experiencing God is not the same for each person. And that's clear in our scripture today. In fact, I've seen clergy essentially say there's only one way of experiencing God, coupled with saying, here's how you're supposed to say it. There's the knowledge piece. Has that ever happened to you? That someone told you, here's how you experience God, and if you don't, you're not really a Christian, and here's how you are supposed to interpret this scripture, and this is what God's about, so therefore you should believe it completely? Has that ever happened to you? Or, when have you been that to others? Now, what I'm about to say isn't popular, but I'd rather have atheists and non-believers in the church than those that believe. Because for those that don't believe, the wonder and mysticism of experiencing God is a privilege to be a part of. Now, let's be clear. It's not about convincing, because that's shaming and way too many believers and clergy do that. Can you relate? You see, it's about providing the conversations to let those who haven't or rarely experienced God experience God in their own way. The best part about working with youth for oh, about 27 years or however many decades I've been doing it is the ability for the youth to say, this is the most ridiculous thing you've ever told us that Jesus is both divine and human. No way. 
And for me to say, you're right, it is ridiculous. Let's talk more. Because it's not all about the knowledge. It's about the experience. Can you relate? Where do you need to experience God in your life right now? In your illness? In your pain? In your relationships? In your loneliness? In your finances? In your traumas? In your abuse? In your angers? In your joys? Where is your life needing to experience God? Or are you a believer limiting and doling your experience to only what you know, not being open to new ways to experience God? Now that topic's a whole sermon or Bible study. So let's just think about tonight. Where are you right now? Are you the one that has yet or rarely experienced God? Or are you the one that limits new experiences because you've already experienced God? See, the scripture is clear. It begins with really the conception of Jesus. But this conception story is different than the Hebrew scripture or what we call the Old Testament. Because the same story is about God allowing a child to be born into a world of violence to save the world. Well, all of those stories were, they were barren women. So Sarah in Genesis 21, Rebecca in Genesis 25, Rachel in Genesis 30, or Samson's mom in Judges 13. Now see, this story, Mary's not barren. And that's clear in the scripture. You see, she experiences God in a brand new way, a way God never did before. Where in your life do you need to be like Mary, being open to new experiences of God regardless of how much you think you know God? Knowledge is not experience. Mary knew God, but Mary entered into a brand new experience. And then we have Joseph. Joseph experienced God in a dream And in that dream, God countered what Joseph thought he should do, believed what he should do. So where is God giving you messages, calling you into the spaces that you don't want to go? Where do you need to experience the messages God has for you so you can act on them just like Joseph? Now there's more to the scripture, but let's just leave it at this. God is active right now in all our lives. Where do you and I need to experience God in new ways? Letting go of our knowledge of what we think it should be. Because if Mary and Joseph let their knowledge win, there would be no story of Jesus. Experiencing God is not easy, and it'll throw you for a loop. But it's the best best experience you can ever have. So where in your life do you need to experience God as the word, as the cornerstone, the vine, and the good shepherd? Where in your life do you need to experience God as the breath of life, the way, Lord, and mediator? Where in your life do you need to experience God as the Son of Man, Messiah, Lamb of God, and light of the world? Where in your life do you need to experience God as the glory of the Lord, the morning star, the redeemer, the son of God? Where in your life do you need to experience God as the prince of peace, the I am, the alpha, the omega, the savior, the man of sorrows, the Christ, and the Emmanuel, God with us? May tonight and every night after tonight, May you be open to God's activeness in your life and experience God in new ways, just like Mary and Joseph did. Amen. And so now, we have an anthem. Is that correct? Yeah, solo, yes. And so part of what is happening tonight, not only do we have a cellist doing solos, um, we're going to do a whole new way of doing communion for tonight because it's the the experience. So I'm going to ask you all, as this song is played, that you sit back and experience not only the music, 
but experience the emotion, experience where God is in the sounds and the notes, experience where God is active in you right here, right now, just like God was with Mary and Joseph. So for those at home, Judy just said you're playing Breath of Heaven Mary song. That was incredible. Thank you so much. So hopefully you just experienced God in a new way. And now part of experience, sorry, my eyesight's bad, so I'm making sure I'm reading it correctly. Um, part of our next experience of God is communion, our open table. So a couple comments about 
what is happening with this is we're doing communion a little differently. What we're going to do is we're going to do the whole liturgy, and then we're going to um, allow those that are worship, worshiping with us virtually to take their elements. And then what will happen is you're going to come in a groups of 12. If you're able to, if not, we will come to you. When you come up here, once everyone's there, you will um, grab your elements and you'll take them. So why do we do this? Well, one is we want this to be an experience. So the experience is walking up, getting to the table. The experience is both individual and communal. So it's a group. It's all of us together at the table taking the elements. Now, this table is open. It is open for all. It doesn't matter who you are, what you believe, what you don't believe. It doesn't matter denomination. It means nothing. This table is God's table, and it's open to all. And so please come to the table, experience it. As you experience walking to it, taking it, and going back, even if you say, I don't experience God, that's okay. Wesley sometimes did not experience God. And you know what he did? He kept trying. And one day at Aldersgate, his heart was strangely warmed, and it moved him from the church to the streets. And so God is here for you to experience. Let's experience God in this new way. We're going to be on page eight of your hymnals. It's the blue hymnal that's in your um, uh, pews. And so with um, that, let's just take a moment of silence. And where is God working within you right now? So together, let's share these words. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenants to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God, God of, of power and might, heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry and ate with sinners by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and by spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, 
poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has, has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and virtually and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them to be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glories is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The table is set. For those worshiping with us virtually, the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ spilled for you. For those here, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ are here for you. We'll have the ushers um, come forward and have you come up in groups of 12. Again, if you're unable to come up, we will come to you.
continuing our experience tonight is our offertory. So take a moment with God. Where is God calling you in your prayers, your presence, your witness, your service, and your gifts? And so we'll have the ushers come forward and we'll have the new Vi sing for us, <laughs> Izzy. And we give thanks that she is here. So let's hear the gift of music. make the younger Vi joke. gift of music. Thank you so much. That was awesome. This evening awaiting the birth of your son our Savior and we thank you and we give back to you for your realm our tithings our t service our testimony our witness all that we are and have is yours please use these to further your realm and let more and more people know the good news of Christ in Jesus name we pray amen We're going to continue our experience tonight. Now with the candlelight hymn, you can stay standing if you want, because we're going to stand in a second anyway. Um, the way we're going to do this is um, I'm going to start the light from the Christ candle, and we're going to pass this to all of you. We're going to dim the lights, um, and we're going to sing together Silent Night, which is number 239. Um, if you're like me, you don't know the words, you probably want to somehow hold the candle next to the book without turning the book on the fire. Um, <laughs> Because if not, you're just going to stand there and um, not just mouth it as things go on. Or you drop things like I just did. Um, what we'll do, thank you. <laughs> After we sing that, um, we're going to keep the lights off with our lights. I'm going to pray. We're going to have a little background cello music as we do that prayer. Um, and then we'll come out of that and do our last hymn. So let us um, begin.
holy God in these moments of the song, Silent Night. Let, let the silence still our hearts. Let these lights guide us to the experiences you have for us. May we know you because we experience you in new ways. May we know you because your light shines around us and in us. May we have these moments of silence with you that draws us closer, that helps us see you in new ways. May tonight's experience be an experience we will never forget. And may we continue to experience you anew every day. It is in your holy name of Jesus, the one that was born for us, the one that taught us who you are, and the one that died for us because of your love for us. We offer this prayer on this silent night. Amen. And so let us sing Joy to the World, number 246. Let's be nice and loud so the people down the street can hear us. and on earth we rejoice and go forth giving all glory to God for the gift of the Son Jesus who shines his light for all to see. Amen. Michael, thank you for being here. Let's give a round of applause. That was amazing. Have a Merry Christmas. We have service tomorrow at 10 a.m. So if you're bored and you want to come back, I'll say something different tomorrow. Have a good night, everyone.